Hey guys, it's Pineapple and welcome to part 2 of the story of Yuto Okotsu, otherwise known as Jujutsu Kaisen Volume 0. If you missed part 1 or you're an anime only that doesn't know what Volume 0 is, Jujutsu Kaisen Volume 0 is a 4 chapter story about Yuta Okotsu, another of Gojo's students at Jujutsu High. He's been mentioned a few times over the course of the anime so far, and in part 1 in this video we're going to keep explaining why there's so much hype and mystery around this character. So click here for part 1 if you missed that. I'm already working on the final part of this series, so please subscribe to stay locked in for that, and of course like this video if you enjoy my retelling of the events. With all that said, let's get right to it after that intro. Hit it! In part one, we left off of a conversation between Yuta and Gojo. Rika is an extremely powerful curse, and trying to dispel or exorcise her would be a nearly impossible task. But Gojo has another plan. He passes Yuta a sword and wants him to train with it, telling him that curses are most stable when they're possessing an item. So becoming a master at channeling her energy through the sword and other weapons and items will not only help Yuta with unraveling Rika's curse, but it'll also serve as a great way to train and master cursed energy through different means. Which of course is perfect for this pair specifically, but more on their curse technique at another time. As Gojo returns from his meeting with the elders that we discussed last time, he comes across Maki and Yuta having a sparring match while Inumaki and Panda sit in the grass and watch. Yuta gets distracted with Gojo's arrival, but Maki bops him on the head and asks when he's gonna score a hit on her. So the two begin again, with Maki using her staff to rush down on Yuta before he does a wide swing that Maki dodges into a grab, once more bonking Yuta on the head. Maki clearly wins here and tells Yuta that he needs to take the fight more seriously because it'll help them both improve more quickly if they fight for real and have to adapt to each other when there can be actual consequences behind each attack. Thanks to Panda, we learn that it's been three months since Yuta started attending Jujutsu High, and we hear about this while he, Gojo, and Inumaki talk about how Yuta and Maki have been getting along over the past few months. Panda goes up to Yuta and asks what kind of boobs he likes, and Yuta says maybe medium size. This makes Panda turn and yell to Maki and give her a signal that, you know, she still has a chance of Yuta because of his answer, so obviously she starts to chase him down and kick his ass. Gojo tells Panda and Maki to keep at it while he pulls Inumaki and Yuta to the side. You see, as we discussed in the last video, Gojo has a mission for these two. Well, really, he has a mission for Inumaki, who's the only grade 2 sorcerer of the group, meaning he is allowed to go on solo missions apart from his class, but Gojo wants Yuta to go along too, mainly because it would be a good learning experience, so he's pretty much just there for support. But don't forget that Yuta is technically a special grade, which is way higher than a grade 2 sorcerer, right? So technically, He's way more capable than Inumaki, he just doesn't know what he's doing yet. Now we're told the reason that Inumaki specifically is being chose here is because apparently he's more suited to handle the curse that they're after than any of the other options. Even hearing this, Yuta is pretty nervous about going on a mission without having Maki or Panda there to back them up, let alone Gojo himself. But Gojo tells Yuta that he shouldn't have anything to worry about as long as he doesn't let Rika fully manifest like she did last time. Gojo tells Yuta that the higher-ups are pretty much at the point where they'll dispose of Yuta if Rika is seen again, so he really has to focus on channeling her cursed energy through items like the sword to be able to use her power without worrying about becoming any more of a target for these shadowy leaders. From here, we cut to Hapi shopping center, a long street in Japan featuring a bunch of small stores and markets that one can browse through on any normal day and enjoy the hustle and bustle of the busy city. That was until it was abandoned, which according to Ijichi was originally due to plans for demolition in a large mall around the area, replacing the small shops. When the area was being inspected to prepare for this demolition, it seems like a group of low-level curses were found around the center. Arriving on the scene, Inumaki heads into a store and grabs some throat medicine, and our boys start their mission, as Ijichi creates a curtain around the area and wishes them good luck. Not even a few minutes after the curtain is raised, Yuta spots an odd curse that looks like a flying fish. No fair, mom. Why does he get more? Then another. Then four more. Ten more. They're... everywhere. Yuta and Inumaki look on as a swarm starts to gather in one place. If we all go together, there's nothing to hear here. Inumaki steps forward, pulling his collar down to expose the rest of his face, which features the marks needed for his curse technique on his cheek and tongue. Inumaki, who usually only speaks using the words for rice ball ingredients thanks to his restriction, says explode, and in unison, all of the small flying fish curses crack open and burst, leaving behind a violent and fiery explosion. 
Yuta seems pretty impressed and also finally sort of understands just what cursed speech is, since the concept of that cursed technique is a little odd to picture without seeing it first. Our boys start to walk off since their mission is done, of course, and Idumaki's voice is very dry and hoarse now, but it seems like everything worked out well. And then, a smile. A man smiles in the darkness, and just at that moment, our two realize that they can't leave because the curtain around the shopping center is still up. Would that mean that their exorcism isn't complete then? But how? Zamba. That's when they notice it. A curse in a meditative-like posture floating behind them. Zamba. It's covered in fur and has a long nose and tusks. Just as Yuta notices that there might be something different about this curse, it raises a hand and says, Zomba. A single beam of light hits the ground in between our two sorcerers, with the light destroying anything it touches in about the area as wide as a person. Inomaki pushes Yuta out of the way and saves him, but one of his fingers gets broken by the technique, which is honestly impressive considering the fact that half of his arm got caught in the attack. For no real reason at all, it's just a little satisfying to see him take good care of that arm, but you know, that's neither here nor there. Inomaki tells the curse to get twisted, and the curse's arm starts to crack and twist up, but whereas before one of Inomaki Inomaki's attacks was able to destroy the whole flock of curses, now the range of the attack is only limited to one arm for this curse. Zumba. Inomaki falls to the ground having a coughing fit due to the backlash from his technique, but Yuta swoops in and gets him away from further pillars of light. The two get away for a moment of rest, but we see that Inomaki actually dropped his throat medicine, so that definitely means that he has to watch how many more of those attacks that he lets off before he's unable to speak at all. Yuta apologizes for Inomaki getting hurt and comes to terms with the fact that they have to exercise the curse to leave, but Inamaki starts walking off on his own and motions for Yuta to stay there by himself. It seems like he's trying to protect Yuta, but it also seems like Yuta realizes that it would make it easier for Inamaki if he didn't have to protect someone while he fought. Motivated to pull his weight and not let his friend go in alone, Yuta strengthens his resolve and tells Inumaki thanks, but they'll do it together. From there, we see the curse floating alone through the main street of the center, and suddenly, a sharp chill runs down its spine. It turns to see Yuta walking slowly towards the curse of his sword extended outwards, and the horrifying presence of Rika, whose cursed energy can be seen gathering around Yuta, forming a much smaller apparition than she did when she materialized in the last chapter. Zamba. The meditating curse gets furious at the sight of these two, and uses its only remaining arm to launch more Pillar of Destruction attacks at Yuta. Now Yuta stays calm, and channels Rika's energy into his blade, coating the sword in cursed energy. He dodges the Pillars of Light, and does a cool flip off a nearby wall while he runs and avoids even more of the cursed attacks. While he moves, he thinks about how kind Inumaki is. Inumaki's words can be so dangerous, so he's fine limiting his speech to only ingredients so that he can keep others safe. Even earlier, he wanted Yuta to stay behind because he was trying to keep him safe more than anything. To be strong and calm a nervous friend down in a situation that they're still not comfortable with. Well, it's time for Yuta to get comfortable in his role here, and as he reaches a true state of calm, no longer nervous or afraid about the curse in front of him, he lets forth a slash full of cursed energy, but the cut doesn't go deep at all. As a counter, the curse hits Yuta with its pillar of light technique, and Yuta suffers an injury to the head, realizing that at his current power, he's no match for this curse alone but he isn't alone. So he slides under the floating curse and grabs Inumaki's throw medicine and throws it to Inumaki in a show of trust and great teamwork. Inumaki downs the medicine, swings around the side of the curse outside of its view and yells, get crushed, which makes the curse suddenly collapse in on itself. It's like some invisible force just took two open hands and closed them together around the curse, crushing it and squeezing it of all of its life. And with that, the curse is exercise, and our boys high five to celebrate a successful mission and an even stronger friendship. But behind that high five is a sad thought. Yuta thinks that he's happy that he's able to unravel Rika's curse, but once he does that, he'll just be a normal person, so he won't be able to stay at Jujutsu High anymore. Until then, he wants to be as useful as he can, so there's clearly more for him to do soon. As the two wait for EGT to lower the curtain behind the area and let them out, we see a man sitting on one of the steel beams, holding up the roof of this center high above our sorcerers. He said he hoped to see the famous Rika herself, but too bad. Maybe next time.
The cursed spirit that he's holding spits something out. The man takes it into his hands, and it's actually Yuta's Jujutsu High ID. The man comments on how Yuta's a special grade, and says that he can't wait to meet him, while also commenting on the best way of returning the ID. Back at Jujutsu High, Yuta and Panda watch Inamaki as he waters the garden. Panda says that Inamaki's had his curse technique since birth, so his whole life he's had trouble with cursing people by accident and things like that. Despite everything that he's been through, he's a kind person. In fact, so kind that he's been thinking of a way to help Yuta with his problem ever since he got there, since their lives have been so similar, and of course he can relate to Yuta's experiences with accidentally hurting others. Panda tells Yuta to be kind to Inomaki, because he's just misunderstood, and to be honest, I'm glad to see these two go on to be sort of like best friends, since I think they really are a lot alike and definitely work together really well as a team. That bond definitely comes into play later on in the Jujutsu Kaisen manga, so pay attention whenever Inomaki or Yuta get mentioned. At the end of this chapter, Maki tells Yuta to get ready for some training, and Yuta has a question for Maki about how he can channel Rika's curse energy into his blade better. Maki says she doesn't have any suggestions, and in fact, she tells tells him not to ask her about cursed energy again. Elsewhere, Ijichi walks up to Gojo and apologizes while covered in sweat. He says someone else cast a curtain above his back at the shopping center, so he couldn't let Yuta and Inumaki out when he thought the mission was over. Additionally, there was a semi-grade 1 curse there that hadn't been identified. Gojo tells Ijichi that it isn't his fault. Their enemy came out of nowhere and was too strong for just the three of them to handle. Gojo questions Ijichi. Who might be responsible for this odd interference? And the answer is Suguru Geto. Geto's a character that we've seen a few times over the course of the Jujutsu Kaisen anime, but he serves a way more active role here in Volume Zero. Geto was expelled from Jujutsu High, and he's one of four special grade sorcerers, making him extremely capable and dangerous. He's killed over 100 civilians so far, and for some reason, he's made Yuta and Jujutsu High his next target. Next time, we'll talk about the Night of the Thousand Demon Parade, just what Suguru Geto is up to, and just how his plans unfold a year before the beginning beginning of the Jujutsu Kaisen anime. We'll talk about it next time, so thanks for sticking by, and of course you can read Jujutsu Kaisen Volume Zero instead of having me narrate it to you by checking it out on Viz, which I'll link below. And they aren't a sponsor or anything, but that's probably the best place to read it since it just got released there with a proper official translation. With that said, I'll see you guys again soon. This is Pineapple, I love you guys, peace.